Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 774th New Social Environment. I'm Chloe, Director of Programs here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Lewis Osmosis and Andrew Woolbright. We're thrilled to welcome poet Jalen Strong here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we're on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustain and enrich the stolen land that we're speaking from. And now I'm thrilled to introduce today's guest and host, Lewis Osmosis is an interdisciplinary artist working in sculpture, drawing, performance, and text. His practice revolves heavily around craft, manufacture, performative actions, and ready-mades, incorporating found objects and vernacular materials from popsicle sticks to graphic t-shirts and hornet's nests, nests to violins. Osmosis received his BFA from the Cooper Union in 2018. And our host today, artist, curator, and critic Andrew Woolbright is based in Brooklyn and is an MFA graduate from RISD in painting. Woolbright is the founder and director of the Gallery Below Grand. He currently teaches at SVA and Pratt Institute. In addition to curating, we are very lucky to have him as an editor at large at the Brooklyn Rail. And with that, it's my pleasure to pass it over to Andrew. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this wonderful conversation. I've been excited about all week. Uh, thank you to the rail staff for making these appear effortless and having them every single day. And can't wait to get into it. Um, everyone, be sure to check out Lewis Osmosis's amazing show at uh, called Recording Artists at Amanita Gallery on May 7th. Um, let's go ahead and jump into the slides because we have a lot to talk about today and, uh, thanks all for joining. Um, I thought it'd be great to start with, uh, Lewis's past work, um, his show last spring at Cap Cap. Um, this is an installation photo from it, but Lewis across the board now getting to see two solo shows over the span of a year, you do this wonderful thing that, um, I think the best way that I, uh, or something that kept coming up for me was um, the way William Popel talks about a friendly transmission of ideas, um, using the vernacular and using uh, cliche as an entry point to investigate larger ideas. Um, and that's starting to kind of appear in this language and work for me. And I'm wondering how you uh, feel that you use cliche. Um. <clears throat> Well, first of all, hi, everyone. Um, I see a lot of fucking people here. Um, I see Naima. Hi, Naima. And Daniel. Hi. Laszlo. Hi. Um, to, to, that, to that point, I mean, like the I've always maintained that like my sort of like uh, first threshold into art making or, or otherwise um, some other creative field or whatever is uh, the fact that like I'm a, a hype beast first. I'm like a Joe Schmo before anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and the cliche, the trope there's like if I were to poeticize it it's it, it affords itself like it's formed via hot air there's a lot of hot air behind it um and to like follow that I guess analogy I don't know like there's there's something uh that like mess of like metaphorical excess right like to use that the essay that we were talking about um I don't know. It's like a very nice little like silly palette to work with, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of is indiscriminate to like how you can animate it however the fuck you want. You know, like, I mean, I'm like the type of person I'll like take like a trope like very seriously um, or, or like something very silly seriously and something serious very silly. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, totally. I mean, I think if we move to the uh, next slide, uh, I know this piece is a really important uh, uh, work for your entire practice, but also kind of a turning point or a transition point in your practice. And I think about how 
humor creates an in-group and out-group, you know, like from a linguistic standpoint, humor is establishing who's in on the joke and who's out. And you typically are starting with like the most universal you can, these like collective giant figures, like a shtick figure, or stick figure as a starting point. And then it gets much more confusing and nuanced and unfamiliar from there. Can you talk about what led to this work? Building yeah, I mean, um, especially for this one, I mean, the there's a Lauren Berlant quote that uh, like kind of has scarred me, um, where they talk about how the the joke, insofar that it can create a split audience, that splitting of an audience, those in on the know, those who don't know it or don't get it, or where it falls flat, regardless of how that happens, it is able to sustain sociality, and mm-hmm. I kind of take that. Uh, like a little step further insofar that it sustains sociality by making it precarious. Like it, it suspends itself and makes it, you can feel this like sort of like uh, this cliffhanger of the joke being like resuscitated, like over and over and over again. Um, and so like in a twisted way, like, I don't know, it's like, it's really cool that that can be a means of like animating a space and animating what have you. So the shtick figure was like a huge fucking um, like breakthrough for me where I was like, um, I like wanted to take redundancy as like a serious method to make a form. There's like repetition, there's seriality and like those, I mean, you know, one need not look no further than fucking Andy Warhol's like shadow things, the fucking the things that Dia, gorgeous, love those, right? Um, like to make like a fucking rainbow panorama of shadows, disgusting. Um, so. I was like, damn, this motherfucker beat me. <laughs> so um, the redundancy thing, uh, I think, is like a really way to, is a really good way to exhaust the form, to like kind of beat life into it, but then also exhaust it to the point where um, you insert a new flavor of steaks into it. Um, oh, that's mm-hmm. another one, steak, like a, like a steak. Um, so again, the, the stick figure uh, is something that, I like love to in regards to figurative sculpture because I hate most figurative sculpture. Um, I think it's a, a toxicity to, to, to civilization. Not, a, not all of them, but most of them, at least nowadays. Um, and anytime I do make something figurative looking, I tend to try and sort of like shoehorn it or like have it live in like a different mode. So like if I make like a puppet, it smells a figuration, but it's first and foremost like a tool for speech, right? Mm-hmm. Like ventriloquy. Um, the, the stick figure has like a very like uh, primordial baseline thing of uh, of of human anatomy. So I I was thinking like, okay, like how can I like really like beat the stick figure like over its head? And I was like, oh wait, like the slippage of stick. And so this, as it relates to like artist artistic production, is kind of like this. Um, as my friend Blake Wedding put it, fucking modern genius, um, uh, a sort of like dandy uh, whose gait like expresses like their like kind of like clumsy confidence, right? It's like, it's like, it's like me, you know? Um, Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, uh, going off that idea, I love that your commitment to the joke, thinking about maybe the possibility of exhausting the joke and then seeing what happens, as you said, you fill the whole thing up with hot air. Like in this... Uh, piece you're almost just like kind of uh, staging the work or gathering the work it's beaver chewed wood you're kind of uh, letting the the beavers be the author and then you're forming it and the stanchions uh, play such an important role within the work too like stay away you know like it, yeah yeah I mean, it's yeah so I mean clever. yeah the 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 beaver chewed wood thing I like I I tether that to like the the habit of like biting a pencil it's like a type of a like mark like mark that's made more incidentally out of one's like own like sort of like anxiety it's like more uh akin to like finger tapping than anything else um and so having that be like the 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 thing that brackets these mo these moments of joinery between these sticks because i haven't manipulated them for shit i've just arranged them and had them like coalesce into this like fuck ass votive right um so yeah yeah 
it, it also just very funny to me. I, I feel like I'm always complaining that there's not enough reductive sculpture, you know, like most sculptors are thinking about assemblage and and adding, and you've somehow managed to find a way to to do a, a reductive sculpture ready-made, which I think is kind of funny. Um, I don't know for an art audience too. I don't know how you did it. Um, and then the next uh, work in this show, I think also shows this kind of, oh, maybe it's later. Uh, uh, you also, um, I don't know if it's still in the slides. Yeah, the the whalebone, or you have the- uh, Oh yeah. Yes, the massive cockroach and the <laughs> uh, whalebone amplifier, uh, two other moves in this first show with Cap Cap. Yeah, the 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 whalebone was was like, uh, I don't know. I like I, this. This was a uh, I had this whalebone for like a long time, and for the I was like sitting on it for so fucking long as to what to do with it, um, and. In the same way that like the shtick figure is just like me sort of like shoehorning the letter H into stick to have it uh, connote, you know, artistic production, to have it connote gimmick, stylization, what have you. Um, I wanted to censor the word uh, uh, white so that it could also, because white and whale are like the same amount of letters, right? And so there's like this like kind of like, uh, it presupposes itself uh, as like a, as like a, what's the word yeah like it's like a censored word or whatever um and yeah this this thing only plays the low ends of stuff um and the sound piece that it plays was made with my friend Lazlo Horvath shout outs Lazlo um yeah hmm. also I'm on two cold brews everyone so you know my fault <laughs> if I'm like fucking like that was wonderful. I mean, also, uh, I think this is a perfect way to, these two pieces are great transition over into the show now up at Amanita because um, both uh, Amanita uh, involves sound, which is like an early exploration in that first Cap Cap show, but also this uh, theme of the bug, which we can talk about a little bit as we pull up slides, uh, but this recurring element in cockroaches, and in this case, crickets. Um, yeah, this is uh, the installation um, for context for those of you who haven't had a chance to visit the show yet. Um, there is uh, sound pumped into the whole uh, space. This uh, what sounds like this like gestural, um, like kind of jazz, but involving violins. This like it sounds like a rehearsal or like a rehearsal. that's kind of extenuated at times. It's real uh, hitting sharp notes. And at times, it's just kind of fading into the background. And then the, the show itself is a series of these kind of rephrased or restaged um, settings. So um, each, uh, there are three different um, stagings of a violin, like you see this, with this kind of bulge coming out of it. One of these uh, figural cadavatars, or these figures that are made with um, flesh and blood, um yes here's one and um then a, a kind of cubist recreation of a guitar if we can get an image of that uh channeled into a paint bucket and finally an image of a cricket uh held over a toilet so there are three of these oh along with these um plywood uh kind of large obelisks uh, uh, covered in old CBGB things. So you see the same idea of an installation done three or four different ways throughout the show. Uh, just to provide context before we, we get into it. Now we can kind of go back. Um, but can you talk about the starting point for this, Lewis? Recording artists, you're using a space that at one point used to be CBGB and uh there's a real playfulness with how you took that as a prompt for the show yeah i mean when when i first got approached to do the show i was kind of hesitant um or rather i should say reluctant because i was like you know i was like oh it'd be kind of like remiss if i didn't address what it was before but i don't want to just put a bunch of studs and plaid on a bunch of shit <laughs> um so i was like okay like how can i go about like addressing the site specificity but you know sort of like disembowel it as i would say like of its specificity maybe like more 
uh, engaged with this like trajectory that it seems to be positing now from like uh, from one venue to another, right? Um, and you know, there's like this like long uh, lineage um, of a lot of these cultural venues, art or otherwise, that used to be other forms of like more niche uh, cultural venues. The CBGB one is like no different. And you know, at one point in the '80s, it was like a, a gallery proper, just called 303 Gallery. So, in a way, it I kind of had this like twisted idea that it kind of precipitated its own preservation by way of it following the model of how institutions work. That the best way to sort of like, um, I guess like the like the the you know cultural preservation like in the press release I wrote was like a. To talking about John Barbados, which is next door, cultural preservation is like a is like a really funny way to essentially just say saving on renovation costs, where you just keep all the shit up in there, um, and then you just kind of like put it in this thing of like, uh, I guess like like visual cryogenics or something like that, right? You know, it's just like ah yes, like the fucking posters are still there, and like you know we got the litter like throughout the fucking space, da da da, this down the third. So, um, I kind of wanted to like. I guess the prompt I'd gave myself was like, how can I uh, animate the sort of like stagnation that I see in this, in the, in how this uh, venue and the space has become like what it is now, right? Um, the way that I kind of imagine it is like, I don't know, it just like oscillates back and forth between like these two poles of like, you know, niche uh, or or like like you know, canon punk venue to like emerging gallery, right? It's just like oscillating between the two. And so it's like trying to catch that sort of like frenetic uh, vibe, right? Uh, yeah. And and the recording, the, 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 the title for the show came about, um, the one thing I think about all the time is espionage. And I think about it in regards to um, viewership that, you know, there's, Andrea, like, okay, okay. I'm like over here running around with references, but like Andrea Frazier's like silly ass piece that I fucking love where she goes into, I think it's the Bill Bao Guggenheim or like the Abu Dhabi Guggenheim where she has like the audio tour going on in the in the phone. And she's just like, she's like, <laughs> she's like, she's like, ah, oh, yes, the wall is like listening to the, to the, um, the audio clip. Uh, I, think about that piece a lot because it kind of presupposes that there is like a per, like an like an uh, illicit perversion to viewership um but on both ends like the artist the, the maker and the one who enters the space the viewer and so when i was looking through all those like cbgb playbills they had this giant slab in the basement that i think the landlord had kept that had all the playbills that they've ever had um at cbgb the one word that popped up the most or phrase was recording artists, mm -hmm. um, which is also funny because it's like a la espionage surveillance sort of like, you know, what is the artist, but like a specimen for like the, you know, the powers that be or whatever. I was like, oh, like recording artists. There's also that like we are out here like, you know, like, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Working for real estate. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think throughout all of your work, and I, I think I'm not the only one who feels this way, but there's a wonderful proximity or distance you're able to keep with your subjects. There's the right amount of like ambivalence to it that you're, you step into something that might be like overly revered, you know, like CBGB, but you're able to also like in the press release, you talk about how it was just a Patagonia right before yeah. you yeah. jumped in, you know, and like, you're able to very quickly take this like maybe revered cultural space and understand that there's more adjacency made like a TGI Fridays at this point of like you said, like keeping the the material or the history alive on the walls. You're able to kind of jump into it and, and say like, uh, this is becoming its own form of kitsch. Uh, let's stop real quick here because this is a really good example of one of these kind of stagings within the show that you're rephrasing and rephrasing multiple times, but what I like about this is uh, maybe we should start talking about the violin itself as this like motif uh, before we get into the cadavatars. But um, you, you each each violin has this like large kind of it looks like a broken arm cast that you've painted or drawn on. Can you talk about that bulging or realizing? 
Yeah, so to circle back to like the cliche thing, um, there's that trope in a lot of uh, music reviews where they uh, say the swell of the violins. Um, and I've always like, since like a kid, I always thought that shit was mad funny. Um, it's just like, it's just like, they're like engorged with like, with, with something, with like potency or something like that. Um, and, you know, it's like used as like this, like kind of like very like hype beast entry level, level one Joe Schmo marker of like aesthetic sublime, right? Of like, you know, having performed the job, it's like uh, sonic efficacy. Um, and so I wanted to use that, that trope and kind of like, push it to this like almost misnomer of an extreme by being like, okay, like, let me make violins that have swelled, they have swollen, they have like achieved this, this swelling that, you know, would mark their uh, success. And also like, it reeks of like their aspiration or, or the player's aspiration that is. And so, um, yeah, I made these like protuberances uh, on each violin. And given that the, the, um, these bandaged masks are like they provide me with like a substrate to make some sort of marks on it i was like oh my god wait like perfect way to like bring in painting into this okay like the fucking the 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 jock medium of fucking art all right you know like <laughs> boom um which i say with like all love um and use that as like a surface to make uh right to like make marks on um, a huge reference here was uh, Frankenthaler, who like I fucking love, and the show Gagosian right now is like pretty, it's pretty damn good. Um, but it's all right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's like that black and beige one that like kind of like hit me. I was like, whoa. I mean, that part of Gagosian is like very like flea market, like you know what I'm saying? Like, like you can you can tell like what they're trying to like do over there. But no, like I'll, I'm sure like all of the times too. But like a lot of the uh, visual descriptions of her work. Um, have this bodily like connotation to it, and they also acknowledge the porosity of her uh, of her uh, paintings. So they'll say like the bleeding image, the weeping image. You know, it like seeps into the thing, and all of her being uh, estranged as like an abex artist because she was a woman at the time. Um, you know, it's like drenched in this like affect that I think she was like trying to like combat all her all her life, and in a way, I think that. Right, I was like trying to like hone in on this like innate affect that's like uh, that's tied affixed to porosity as it relates to like uh, like a pictorial space, and use like the given substrate of like a bandaged wound to have that live to like you know be have that be the housing for for that you know, and e and each one is named swollen violin and then parenthetically they have. Uh, like another name that alludes to something, at least in my mind, like an aspirational motif. So this one is called autographs. Um, then there's black tie events. There's a, uh, which is like obvious, uh, galaxy boo boo, which is like a very like, uh, like hype beast thing. Like there was a time like in the, in the sneaker culture when like, or no, actually like indie sleaze culture, like writ large, where like galaxy was just the vibe, you know, like think Azealia Banks, Cara Delevingne, like, you know, that time. Mm -hmm. um, and what else? Yeah, Jersey, which is like the collegiate like number thing on the back of a Jersey um, and inverted Union Jack, because what's more aspirational than the, the United Kingdom in it? <laughs> of course, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I going back to the, the violin, you know, um, it's amazing to me that uh, I've always appreciated your writing. Uh, you're a great writer and some and avoid the cliches that you're always pointing out um, with your writing. Uh, but I, I really appreciate in this that there's your choice to avoid cliche of the swelling of violins. You go through this kind of like, I, I was thinking of Lee Lozano, like looking at how you're kind of like really, uh, uh, kayfabing through the idea of abstraction or you're really um totally getting immersed in it if you're saying if this if this violin is a living breathing thing what happens if it swells or what happens if it has a zit that starts glowing or what happens if i can make it uh lee is doing it through painting but you are really to use sienna guy's word you're animating this cliche or you're like uh to to 
as she puts it, find the metaphorical excess that can be created by really believing in this object at the end of it. Can you talk about that that metaphorical excess that you're interested in? Yeah, I mean, the that essay is like so like Bible for me. I mean, it's like literally uh, about animation and has like a like a it, it talks about like the racialized affect um, that exists within a lot of animation within popular culture. Um, and so like one thing she brings up is like um, claymation in that it inherently has like this uh, visual jitter to it when it's like translated onto a screen. And, you know, it at one point that declares it's sort of like distance from an actual bodily representation, but it also declares the medium that the thing lives within. Um, and I think that what I would call like produces like a slop that, um, the, aka the excess that the viewer kind of has to like, uh, I guess claim a position like in relation to um yeah like Lee Lozano is like a great example um and fucking oh what a fucking artist man um but you know like she is she does nothing but push like uh things to like their extreme so much so that they kind of become like a perversion of themselves I mean like you know great example is like the retirement piece where she's just like the, the dropout piece where she drops out from the fucking art world becomes an NPC like willingly in fucking uh, and a non-playable character that is in Dallas, and then I think Dallas, yeah, 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 and then does a boycott where she refuses to interact with women until she dies. You know what I'm saying? Like she literally, like out of the the deficit, um, or no, like like this, like sort of like she'll never be the patriarch like proper, but she can perform the job of it. You know what I'm saying? Like just yeah. by overperforming, just like like being hell bent on this endeavor she can become the the meninist she could never you know what i'm saying like yeah um like Salawit, like i remember when i first came across that piece there's like a quote where Salawit would, would say whenever they go to they would go to a restaurant um if there was a waitress she would literally just like look away <laughs> that shit is so crazy totally oh I mean, I think too, like it, like that committing to the bit is what you're doing through sculpture and art and committing to the bit, like you said, that Lee Lozano is capable of doing on, on your own scale of finding the point where it breaks or finding the point of exhaustion. Like it, it, I don't think it's near the show, but it reminds me of like in pro wrestling, uh, the, the term kayfabing is important, mm -hmm. you never break mm -hmm. character, but there's this other important aspect to it called a shoot. Uh, where uh, pro wrestlers, where the, the moment in, in a pro wrestling match where it becomes real and is no longer a kayfabe, it's called a shoot. And there are all these strange moments that you can find online where like Hulk Hogan is in the ring with another wrestler and you can hear it picked up on the mic or are you shooting on me? They don't know if like someone is actually trying to kill them in the ring or if they're right. still acting. Uh, the moment that uh, acting can kind of become uh, so real that no need, no one in the ring knows if it's real still anymore. Right. It's important. Yeah, this is like that that um, the corpsing thing, like that the, the theater yeah. term where, um, yeah, I mean it's a bit archaic, but it has like a lot of like uh, potency behind it. But uh, that. You know, corpsing is when one is on stage, like an act, like an act is on stage or whatever, and they laugh, and so that like breaks the sort of like assigned role that they uh, are prescribed with, and that's cool too because it kind of like, it assumes that laughter is more, is more closely uh, tethered to the audience than it would be to the actor. Like crying is a lot closer for the for the audience to perform than for the actor. Like that is like you know that's within like the realm of a. Uh, of a of assumed like belie believability but mm -hmm. laughter it's like it's like ho, 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 ho. it's like yo what, what the fuck like what are you doing bro? like you know mm -hmm. yeah i mean i i, I love that phrase corpsing uh of like breaking the performance through laughter uh can we go back one image to the um yes thank you uh because because within these these rephrased structures that you're doing a number of times that makes me think of um yes what happens through corpsing when you do the same thing kind of slightly changing it 
uh, this like four different times in the show. And May specifically, I think something really interesting is produced with the photographs that are on the shelves. If we could skip to one of the cricket photos. Um, can you tell us about the how these things came about? Uh, <laughs> um, fucking, so an, an essay that's like, you know, essentially become part of like my fucking, my, my cerebellum at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, another, another shout out to Blake because he put me on. Blake is really just like, uh, my man Blake is really just like a walking J store. I swear to God. Yeah. But um, <laughs> so Pope Bell's essay, Canary in a Coal Mine, which is like, every time like I write something, I have that just like on my screen. Just yeah. one, I love when artists can write and write in a fun way, just like, you know, full stop. Um, Cause the format that he does it in is like this, like very sort of like, almost curt like bullet listed format um mm -hmm. it's like a bunch of these like takes not hot not whole just takes um just kind of like one after another um and in the essay he took it's a it's an essay about performance and you know canary in a coal mine where he talks about the liveness of performance and it's like precarity as a medium um he has this like really fucking astute way of talking about fluxes where he says um, something along the lines where he like diagnoses it with this like extreme self-consciousness because mm -hmm. of how um, unrelenting it was with documenting itself over and over and over again. And, you know, in the same way that like uh, the, what is the gallery now, it precipitated its like current version in the eighties as a gallery. Um, the, this like unrelenting documentation of fluxes like precipitated the advent of videotape as a means to make performance into a commodity, right? And mm -hmm. so then he talks about like, what of like a performance that, um, you know, whose documentation can exist in like a different format other than what is, you know, already been like canon. Um, a great example he says is talking about karaoke yeah. where the docu where the documentation is to hang over the next day right mm -hmm. like love 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 so yeah. this is like kind of like my response to it where um i think of these photo pieces and this is also like my first time doing photo work but i think of these photo pieces more as um sort of mental prompts that to elicit the mental image of a performance so they're called jiminy's concerto um Jiminy's concerto slash custodian's interlude. And then parenthetically, uh, they're each affixed to a different museum. So I, I took a cricket to a bunch of museums, like the, the, the five big ones in New York, and uh, went into the bathroom and presented it into, you know, it was like, quote unquote, planting it in the bathroom. Um, mm -hmm. This kind of like travelocity gnoming of the cricket you know like the tourist and the cricket are but the same and our tourists and the viewer are but the same thing um and the to hopefully like prompt in like a very cheeky way this idea of like you know after the museum the institution has closed and it's all dark there's just like the one custodian you know just like doing their thing or whatever and then they hear yeah. right <laughs> little little concerto yeah. um and Obviously, I use Jiminy for like the cliche of, you know, the most famous cricket in the world is Jiminy. We all know this. Mm -hmm. um, be, but also in the same way that I'm kind of like outsourcing performance via this um, via this cricket, but also outsourcing or at least trying to outsource performance to photo documentation in these like little mumsy, like, you know, humdrum little like tchotchke looking things. Um, the Pinocchio movie uh, is really a good way to talk about this because Pinocchio, like his his realness as a boy, um, is contingent on Jiminy being his conscience. Like the blue fairy, I think that's her name. Um, you know, she's like, she's like, you know, fucking knights him and hires him as the conscience, which is funny because it's to say that like, okay, so boom, like what affords him his liveness is like val validity as like a little boy, a real boy. Um, mm -hmm is this outsourcing of, uh, of moral, of conscience, right? Which is like a great way to get back to animation, you know? So, yeah. Well, I also, I mean, I, I just think it's such a fun piece and um, it, it, it gets into your humor of like this almost reverse enunciation done with language. Like you said, like the cricket 
at the end of the day at the museum like crickets implies that like the museum space is actually a performance space and the performance wasn't good that day you know to like hear crickets at the end of the joke um so i like this it, and going back to william pope l there's the the way he talks about karaoke too that it reminds me of is that you can disempower the song that mm -hmm. like you can uh, by performing the song drunk, performing it to laughter, performing it to exhaustion, it it breaks the the formal qualities of it and turns it into like the the humorous thing. And that kind of reminds me, we talked about it, but something this show got me to pretty quickly was how fosters and archival impulse that like there's something to be said about uh, your sense of archiving of drunken like the drunk karaoke through the song or like being able to use the cricket to kind of disempower the museum that reminds me of the way foster talks about tacit Dean using things that look like they should be uh art history but are not there's this utopic thing that they could be a, a, an alternate timeline of art history and what's created in that absence that like really like all these restagings and rephrasings of art history reminds us that there's an absence that's presented by there's no forward progress maybe right i feel like you're you're really laying a critique but i wonder how you feel about that no i mean fucking what's it called um yeah like tacit adeem you know like the, the the filmic meditation um uh what's it called she uh She's like very clever in like using objects that uh, or, you know, films or whatever that like have like an assumed historicity to them. Like they look the part um, a la and that goes back to staging. I mean, I can like kind of like also this is something I've been thinking about a lot, too, is like this like trend right now of all like sculptures looking old already. Like they arrive looking old. They look vintage. They look distressed um, as someone who was like engaged in that 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 maniacal behavior before. Um, and I kind of have like this like you know, conspiracy, big brain theory on that, because I think, uh, you know, sculpture is like always like in this like older sibling, younger sibling rivalry with painting. Um, and I think this trend of a lot of sculptures arriving into the white cube, looking old already, it kind of is, I understand it, or see it as like a gesture to try and dress it with the look of provenance, right? Mm -hmm. um, that like sculpture is like a lot more estranged from. Um, and so and so there's like this weird like this like uh displacement i guess or like this lodging that like happens that I, at least i see and the hershorn part in that essay also like really like resonates with me specifically when he talks about <laughs> his like his sicko fucking uh uh installation things to fucking to spinoza to bataille to fucking you know who ha fucking jabroni over here where he'll like choose like these like more minor sectors of where they're from, like whatever countries they're from, you know, like yeah. yes, the minor sectors of where they are reside and so on and so forth. <laughs> Was that Slavoj? Was that Zizek? Yeah, I had, to, I had to sneak in the Zizek. <laughs> All right, thank uh, you, for this. They're, they're Slavoj. Organization. We got it. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I think siblings is a great way to maybe jump us over to the 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 cadavatars, uh, if we could go to one of those because. There's Segway four alert. throughout the show. Uh, there's a mother and a father who are both actively looking uh, at at two of the kind of phrased structures. There's a baby that's crawling towards one in the back, and then there's uh, the the older sibling is kind of running free in the back. And I took that as kind of a generational critique that maybe the parents reinforce art history while the that you know the baby is drawn to it you know and the first generation or the firstborn is the only one who's allowed to kind of for a while run free or reject it but how are you thinking of these cadavatars yeah i mean every every work in the show in one way or another like lives within a series of itself or like a twinning of itself with like the the, the sinks are like the twins um but the and i think with each sort of like uh mode of seriality that exists I think they operate, they like live in like one sector of what seriality can look like. So with say the um the 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 violins, I kind of think of that it's more like iterative in the same way that like colorways of a sneaker are iterative. It's like the same sneaker, but it has like a different color, like different material, like whatever. With um the cadavatars, 
a portmanteau of cadaver and avatar. Um, I was trying to like hint at the nuclear family as like its own subset of seriality. So like a big, a big reference here is obviously Charles Ray. Okay, like hello. But yeah. I was calling this like, I've been calling this like my uh, humdrum, impoverished, uh, budget friendly uh, Charles Ray. You know what I'm saying? Cause it's like, that's why I love the word reclaimed mannequin, right? And like why craft and manufacture, I think, you know, when you craft a thing so much so to the point of like overperformance, it can perform the job of looking the part of like a manufactured object. Like, you know, I can kind of imagine like if one were to go to like a mannequin website, there's like, there's there's blue, there's like chrome and then there's flesh, right? And this being the, the flesh uh, iteration. Um, also another one here too, the, the motherfucking queen of mannequin sculpture. And this is, this is another thing too, right? I have a mental Rolodex of sculpture tropes that I need to like beat down that bog my mind. And this was like my mannequin attempt because I failed at it before, but now I like came, which we don't have to talk about, but, <laughs> but this is me, this is me avenging myself. But um, yeah, like the, how I said before, like anytime that there's something figurative in like any sculpture I do, it's always never like my own, um, it's never like my own construction of a figure. It's like a ready-made, uh, it's like something that already exists figuratively. Um, and mannequins before anything else are for, are modes of display. So um, they're kind of like a placeholder for like a would-be subject, like the would-be viewer. Um, but I wanted to, in like a more theoretical way, like kind of uh, get into a sort of like, get into like, like make, make like a mode of viewership that like arrives already mortified, right? Like I, I, like, it's always like funny to me when I go into like a museum, like say like, there's like a Rothko on a wall, right? And then a motherfucker is just like standing in front of it. And they're just like, they're just like, Hoo. they're like, Hoo. you know, they're like arrested, frozen by the thing, which like, you know, same thing happens for me here and there, but I'm like, that's so silly, right? Like the wall, the wall has got like, the wall's got you looking dumb. Like, that's great. Love it. Um, so I wanted to, kind of make these like models of would-be viewerships that uh already arrive having been mortified you know like they they wear their mortification right and again to the thing of redundancy all I really did was like I just put like like I just donned the mannequins really like this is all pastiche this is all surface treatment right I just covered them with essentially paper mache and you know all of like Hollywood like prop production just had to do the fucking job mm -hmm. Yeah, they wear mortification. I, I put it like that. I found these really complicated because, I, like, I think it's somewhere in that budget friendly and that redundancy thing. It really, I mean, like, I I looked at the you know walking into the show, I immediately was just like Charles Ray Hellraiser, you know, mm -hmm. and and the fact that it's this ready made mannequin made it difficult for me to engage with the work. Like I found myself seeing it and then going directly to the cubist guitar and the violins and the photographs going through the whole show. And the last thing I ended up looking at were the cadavatars. And then when I finally did, uh, they have such a strange presence in the space. Like you get close to them and you kind of feel like they could just like move at you or oscillate towards you or kind of just like glitch towards you a little bit. It's a really, it's it's an interesting speed that you're somehow oftentimes actually you're oftentimes doing it where like the ready-made is kind of stepping slightly towards the assemblage but also like still ready-made and I think that strangeness is really really interesting within all of your work thanks I'm man how you think about like the I mean, maybe redundancy is the language but I wonder if there are any other ways you think about the found object versus like the 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 kind of pile on gluing screwing additioning that you can do to it the subtle gesture yeah i mean the you know one of like my fucking pet peeves is like when someone buys something on amazon and mm -hmm. they and they and they call it a ready-made piece right. um like i mean it, it it is sure but like it's like a very it's like you know big big man jeff bezos has like completely changed the economy of like finding yeah. what finding an object like implicates right, right? Consumer. And so I think, yeah, you know what I'm saying. And so, like, I think, um, in in like the the perversion of that, there, like, it affords like this new pocket, or not new, but like 
this like more contemporary pocket of like what modification can mean, like what like re reclamation of an object can mean, right? Um, not in like a triumphant way, just like literally like making it for oneself, right? Like revising it, right? Um, uh, yeah, and specifically with the, I like that you said this like sort of like, you didn't arrive to them until you like were leaving type of thing. Um, because I really have been thinking about them as like, I want to put viewers up in here, like models of viewers, right? That have beat viewers to their job of viewing. They've already beat you to the job. Like they're there. They mm -hmm. are there. You know, they're 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 out here looking at the fucking work. Okay. Like one yeah. of them's like, like reach for a wire. The kids already in the back, like having his time, you know, running around and shit. Hoo ha hoo ha, right? Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah, it, I, you're totally right. It, they do the work of like canned laughter in a reality sh or in mm. a sitcom. You know, it's like they're doing the gazing so you can kind of walk around the room and then you're like, the most obvious thing is the thing you look at the least because they're holding that space for you. That's brilliant. Yeah, yeah it's also that. cool too that I saw like a bunch of people, I mean, me, 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 I mean, I installed them this way, but that, you know, they would try, they would like look at their faces and then try and like, match up exactly like where they're looking at you know what i'm saying which is like cool it's like the model thing right it's like it's like oh, okay we're like locked in you know like i'm okay bet i love that could we uh jump to a slide of the sinks and while we do that i really uh found myself also really wanting to ask you um are you an animist or how do you feel about animism or like, because there's a, there's a moment where like William Popel talks about uh, friendly transmission uh, where he talks about kind of like the prosaic assemblage of like the vernacular, but things relying on each other. Maybe it's coincidence or maybe it's collective, but I wonder how you, you feel. Is that a term that you would feel comfortable with or is that too woo woo in the universe? Yeah, I mean, like, I'm all here for the woo-woo shit. I'm not gonna hate on it, but uh, not my not my flavor. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, the animism thing, like, for sure, as like a like a sort of like distant relative to, um, or like a conduit to talk about like liveness, right? Like the liveness of the thing. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, in 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 something I always think about as like a model for thinking about what is like the liveness of a sculpture is iron lungs. Right, that like they like sort of like they precip they, which is like one like an archaic, um, you know like medical device, um, and it's like honking, it's fucking gargantuan. So like you know it's like it looks like a fucking barbecue smoker, right? Like that shit looks crazy, um, but they do the job of breathing, not to like have to like sustain life, right? They don't. It's they're not meant to like, try and like uh, improve health. They're not meant to like. They're like sustaining like a like a like a already a, a arrived at point within within liveness. Um, and so, yeah, like animism insofar that it hints at liveness. I mean, with the with the sinks, this 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 piece right here, it's also like a Park MacArthur shout out. Like I literally just like stole from her the um, she had a piece, I think, at probably Essex where uh, she put a Wikipedia link on the wall to a disability advocates, ad, ad, advocator, I don't know the word, um, and writer named Martha Russell. And I remember like seeing that shit, I was like, I was like, oh my God, like not this wall, like making me like type in this fucking <laughs> name, that's crazy. Yeah, um, yeah. Mike so, Cloud does a similar thing with the typing or painting links into mm -hmm. the, his paintings. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, mm -hmm. I, I have the same feeling from it. Yeah, and you know, like, considering that this would be like my like sort of like, you know, stolen Park MacArthur move and like, you know, baby Heim Steinbeck uh, gesture, like baby like Lawrence Wiener gesture. Um, the sinks, you know, th there's like that linguistic sort of like platform that it's like operating on. The sinks are called uh, sunk, uh, no, linked sink number one and number two. And then the link is called sunken link. And, and I also like love, you know, like, like in 20, the reference here is like in 2014, I'll be quick with it. The um, the Met made this like hyper real rendering, like recreation of the bathrooms in CBGB. And I like saw it like incidentally, because I just happened to be over there. Um, and the sinks are kind of like, you know, this poster child of like, you know, yesteryear, like punk yesteryear or whatever. 
And I kind of, I was like, okay, boom. They've like turned the sinks into like actors. It's like sort of like Jack and Jilling of like the sink of the bathroom sink. Uh, they've turned, they've like animated them into like a mode that they were never afforded, but are doing the job of. So I'm like, let me make, let me try and make two dumb actors, right? Prop them up on something incongruous to sinkness and put it in front of this wall uh, whose dimensions I think are more akin to a screen. The aspect ratio is more akin to screen than anything architectural and kind of have it like read as like a sort of like makeshift end credit moment to like after walking through the entirety of the gallery and then you walk back out. Yeah. Love that. And uh, it's hard to see in these images, but the, the first image, they have these like little kind of porcelain tiles of paintings wrapped around them that that some of them look like they're from actual paintings by like Mikhail Maharu or Raul de Kaiser, or Michael Kreber. And then some of them I think are, I couldn't place, maybe they're made up. Yeah, uh, I was trying to do like a, like a, like a low AI moment where I would like either make mini, like a mini Sigmar poke or just like make one up myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm using like the, like the given in uh, structure of like punk or no, like, like bar bathrooms having like a bunch of like stickers all over the fucking place mm -hmm. right and i'm like oh my god so silly this looks like a salon <laughs> yeah. so like let me like a, you know like a like like a salon type of like hanging so let me like put that on a sink you know what i'm saying like why the fuck not and this one i was like kind of wanted to use that to make this like constellation like uh, a bad big dipper sort of like moment right like mm -hmm. like you know connecting the dots <laughs> literally connecting the dots hello you know okay. I love this one. I, th I think my favorite is the const the 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 jock painters again showing their their presence of the, mm -hmm. the near factor fiction being applied to it. Yeah, yeah and I, you know, like it's more of like a titular gesture, but like you know, it kind of does. It kind of creates like this, like sort of like feedback loop of itself within like like links and sinks. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it's very smooth brain. You know, which like you know, I like love. It's like one of my favorite methods, right? Of course. Mm -hmm. I, I want to uh, hand this over to our audience, who I'm sure has a lot of questions, but I have one last thing that I'd like to talk about, kind of sing through the whole show. Um, one more time with William Popel, talking about dramaturgy versus installation versus staging, which I also think kind of has a presence in the show. And I'm wondering how you're thinking about your work is... Could it be a staging where you're drawing and redrawing and retrying again and finding exhaustion versus like a maybe this whole thing is a gestalt of a dramaturgy? How are you thinking about it? Yeah, I mean, I, I've been I've been uh, sort of. I, I've been I've been phrasing it as like, uh, I think the installation is more is more akin to like uh, staging LARPing as installation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like every time I see sculptures like in a gallery there's something like so I don't know it just like reeks of like aspiration you know it has to like engage with like the same terms of like spatiality that like the viewer does and so in the same way that like a stage does um and a, a big fucking reference point here too all of the lighting like this like cold uh like softened insane asylum lighting mm -hmm. um is like Lars von Trier's Dogville uh, which literally happens on a sound stage, and you know, sound stage, CBGB, you know, fucking hoo ha, right? There we go. I love that. I yeah. love I love the von Trier reference. You're totally right. That that dimmed lighting and the shadows it produces uh, really you feel that as you're like walking through the show. Yeah, uh, yeah it, it's it's funny too that like the um, I like really like that none of the shadows like uh, repeat themselves. Like there there's like something uh, like uh it at least to me like generates like this kind of like weirdo uh psychosis like of the ground where like none of the shadows uh are even attempting to like quote unquote rhyme with one another yet every object is repeated in some way it has like another iterative form right mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah well lewis thank you so much for putting together this thoughtful exhibition and making us think about this friendly transmission uh what what a world without telos but all these subtle uh how humor can be used maybe to employ absence thinking about critical absence and then what you're creating in the space of that uh it's it's a it's a really thoughtful show i really Thank enjoyed you. it and i'd love to uh 
invite everyone to jump in with your questions because I'm sure we have many. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lewis and Andrew, for that conversation. Um, and we'll go ahead and move into the Q&A now. Um, the first question is from GE. Eleanor is going to ask on GE's behalf. If anyone else has a question, um, please raise your hand or post your question in the chat or message me directly, and I'll go to you next. Thank you. And thank you, GE, for this question. Um, GE says, Lewis, do you believe in ambivalence and ambiguity for its own sake, or is it to be there for the pure pleasure of activation? Are you working to return to the mothership of ambiguity and full out surprise in art? Thank you. Uh, I don't know if G is still here, but first of all, G, shout out to you. You're, you're mm -hmm. fucking, you're fucking paisan, you're fucking true cuisine. Mm -hmm. um, the ambiv amb I mean, ambivalence is like one of like my fucking like keywords so much so that like I've had to like reel it in a little bit how often I use it. Um, but the, you know, uh, Lauren Berlant again, uh, fucking in their last book on the inconvenience of other people um, really takes like a deep dive into like the actual uh, originary like definition of ambivalence because now it's like kind of accrued this like automatic like negative connotation when really it means just like intense intense mixed feelings and again this goes to the thing of like metaphorical excess right like working within that slop um to like using ambivalence to try and like not make claims but have things that operate like they do claim something right um and i think ambivalence insofar with like liveness is super cool because you know to me the way i tend to define liveness is like the operative efficacy of the of a thing right like how how like how it can accomplish that which it sets out to do and also on the back end of that how it can like reinstate terms or stakes of uh of which like dictate the life that we like the terms of life that we live how we can reinstate its own terms into that like whether it be shoehorning or like bracketing with its own terms or whatever um and there's like yeah ambivalence is like a great way to go about that thank you thanks for that question ge and thanks for that answer lewis I'm going to give Andrew has a good question. So I'm going to give Andrew a chance to ask one more. Um, and I have a question and I know Fong's going to ask a question as well. If anyone else in the audience would like to ask a question, just raise your hand or message me directly. Thanks. Lewis, I just want to jump in. Uh, you talked about being interested in uh, and also loving and hating tropes within sculpture, loving and hating the mannequin. And you mentioned that there are other tropes that you spot uh, when you go to shows and museums that drive you crazy. I was wondering if you would share any of the other ones that are kind of in your periphery that you're thinking about. Like, I like oldness and mannequins, but something else that you're starting to consider uh yeah uh fucking uh like like fucking uh fluorescent or neon like abjection like fucking like pink slime on something um or like like glittery like gloopy like things on it as someone who was like engaged in like the lump in the gloop you know what i'm saying still does i'm trying to like you know battle that fucking goliath um yeah there's like a lot of like bullshit like from like that you see like on a Fluxo platform, Cuba, Paris, you know, like these like really like impoverished, like aspirational contemporary art dailies, where they just like take like an action figure and then like dip it in green and then like call it a day, right? No, absolutely not. Does not, it does not work like that, okay? No, no. Um, what's another one? Oh yeah, like all these like fucking, uh, these like uh, fake text painters, you know what I'm saying? They'll just put like the, like it'll be like a, like a wash of orange and it'll say like, drill or some shit you know what i'm saying like um i mean i say that as like someone who has like engaged in both of those terroristic behaviors um but you know it's like i think it's like up to it's like a responsibility of every artist considering that you're you're engaging in cultural output to also be wary of the trends that you're participating in or like aside to right 
That's awesome. And uh, for those of you thinking of a question to ask, I would highly recommend finding a way to get Lewis's opinion on things, which is one of my favorite activities is finding a question because uh, Lewis uh, always love your opinions on the art world. Thanks, Joe. Thanks for that question, Andrew. The next question is going to be from Daniel. Daniel, I'll give you the chance to unmute. Hi, Daniel. Uh, hi, Lewis. Well, can you hear me? I'm sorry. I, uh, my headphones yeah. have been doing weird yes. things. Okay. Um, Lewis, we've talked about this a little bit, but my question for you, and also I should apologize in advance, I had to dip out for like five minutes in the earlier part of this call, so maybe this was addressed, but I know that you're making this show, um, or the way you approached making this show, um, perhaps because of the venue, because, perhaps because of the history, um, I, it's different from the way you've approached previous shows, and I guess I'm curious how it's changed the way you'll think about future shows and, um, and whatever's up next. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, with like every, I think, I think with like the, the solo that, uh, <laughs> that we did at Cap Cap, um, you know, that being like my first solo, which I'm like always going to be like proud of and like will always like hold like right here. Um, I didn't go in there with a problem. And I just like went in there with like a bunch of uh, straw men solutions that um, I think were you know, they kind of like forged the through line, like just by means of proximity and like by the fact that they're kind of made in like uh, similar vernaculars or whatever. Um, this one, you know, I was presented with a fucking, a silly ass problem, whatever that problem or like a, like a whole bag of them, you know? And yeah, I guess, I guess this is like Cooper brain or like home, like Cooper home test brain, but I'm just like, yeah, like I really respond to a prompt self-imposed or otherwise. Um, so yeah, I think that'll incidentally like kind of recalibrate how I go about making like a quote unquote body of work um, for like whatever like would be shown is that I think, yeah, I'm good at responding or I like responding to prompts and I think I'm good at giving them, doling them out to myself. So, yeah. Thanks for that question, Daniel, and for that answer, Lewis. Lewis, I'm wondering if, um, there were no rules about where you could make work in New York. Where would you want to make an installation? Mm. Oh man, fucking uh, oh probably. I mean, on some like fucking like like homecoming type shit. Uh, just cause like <laughs> I went to middle school there, and like you know I like, grew up over there. Uh, fucking uh, under under the boardwalk in Coney Island. Yes, love it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I think I could do some nut ass shit down there. <laughs> got any got any original like immediate thoughts of what you would do under the boardwalk? The first idea, I mean, I wouldn't do it. It's not really my bag, but the first thing I I would imagine would be like a like a bad racial right white read, like you know, like casting like the like the like the space between the sand and the actual wooden slats. You know what I'm saying? And then like putting them on top. I would that's like a bootleg white read, but you know, the first <laughs> idea. Thank you. And Fong's going to ask the last question. Here you go, Fong. Motherfucking Fong H. Bowie. <laughs> How goes it? What? Never met anybody who curses so many, every two, three curse were in one sentence with great charm. As I you. have no idea what you're fucking talking about. I don't either. <laughs> so how do you get away with it? It's amazing. It's a mystery to me. So Lewis, congratulations on the show. Uh, Thanks, Fong. I know that so much of the performative aspect of art, you know, be it living theater fluxes you talk greatly about and whatnot, but would because of your, you know, thinking about the 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 aspects or a certain commercialization of art and whatnot, you you mentioned in the past. But have you ever thought, I, my question is about Otto Povera, you know, because in the late 60s, when our friend Germano Silan coined the term, Otto Povera was really linked into the political, radical political atmosphere in Italy at the time, you know? Uh, so my question is that certain aspects of using non-precious and impermanent materials, you know, with the, the twig, drags or earth and soil and whatnot, 
I was so essential to to their making. And I wonder whether the material you chose to work with, you know, particularly paper mache, could it be in the same thinking? And whether Otto Povere II itself is something that you have thought through also in in the in in your conceptual thinking of of making the object in your own yeah. work. Yeah, Arte Povera, like, like, uh, Povera, like, like, for sure, like, is one of the, you know, the, the many vertebrae that make up the fucking work or whatever. But, um, I mean, I, I'm also like a, like a firm, uh, believer of like trying to pinpoint the more pragmatic and practical reasons for like aesthetic development. So, like, um, like Mackenzie Wark, you know, who we love, she has like a great uh, take about when she talks about like the Abex, uh, it's like a lecture I think she did like a couple of years ago, but um, where she kind of poetically states it, but like that the Abex painters were more just like having fun with uh, industrial chemical, like different makeup for paints. And this is what like they arrived at. Um, and I say that to say that this like sort of recent resurgence of Arte P P uh, Povera uh, in contemporary art, I think is more incidental just because it's the, you know, the world is just very expensive. Whereas like, you know, in its conception, it had like a bit more of like a capital P like philosophical um, uh, uh, logos behind it. Um, that's not to like, you know, put any value judgment on it. If anything, I actually think pinpointing the pragmatic uh, practicality behind these things is cool because it grounds it in like more civic terms. It grounds like like artistic production in more civic terms, um, yeah. which tends to be on the back end for a lot of artists. So, yeah. Okay. Um, that sounds good to me. Uh, practicality. So that's, that's basically you saying wherever the studio, the given space to you will generate the work that you make. Yeah. And to the paper mache thing, it's kind of like my uh my uh you know working class hero version of a of a of a of fiberglass. Oh, you mean like yeah. Bruce Springsteen hungry, hungry heart. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. I got it. All right, thank you thank so much. Congratulating the show. Thanks, Fong. You have a hungry heart. That's it. That's <laughs> so thank you. Back to you, Chloe. Thanks, Fong. That was amazing. Thanks so much, Lewis, for answering everybody's questions. At The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading, and it's my pleasure to introduce our poet laureate of the day, Jalen Strong. Multi-hyphenate, slow-walking, seed-catching body Jalen Strong is beneath the tree calculating how the shadows might rain. He's the former librarian curator for the Playground Annex, his work has been featured at MoMA PS1, Artist Space, Pratt Institute, Brown University, MoCA Cleveland, the Center for African American Poetry and Poetics, and elsewhere. Please join me in welcoming Jalen. Thank you so much for that, Chloe. Uh, yeah, wonderful talk. Thank you so much, you two. That was that was really really great. I'm very glad to hear that. Uh, I'm gonna do set a timer for five minutes. I'm gonna do five minutes of poems. Uh, I wanna bring Polo back. Like a big man and horse tattooed on my eyelids. I blink and all of a sudden you see the consumerist internationalist. For some reason, my chest reads in the boldest font. Germany or España. The Oslo boots with the strap refrain from dirtying my, dirtying my biblical prevalence of my feet. Please don't step on them. There's a causation to awaken my recital of epigenomic fever. I only know anger when defending the image of my body suspended from strings. I am a real boy, hungry from the slime of class divisors when relying on the presence. I want to bring back the first taste of White Castle and to tell my cousins I am a faggot with real city boy swags, New York City pigeons moan, strange, low, mournful, quivering cancer-like moans, mixed with hungry hyena barks, 
and gulping loss of forest cries. New York City pigeons are not relaxed like pigeons during and sunning at Marcel Duchamp swimming pool in San Francisco. New York City pigeons are not happy like pigeons standing on the head of the woman selling bananas on a street corner in Johannesburg, New York City pigeons. New York City pigeons flap viral leather fungus dust from wings into faces and sit on steps vocalizing and waiting for the death of humankind. New York City pigeons are not friendly like pigeons eating flaky crescent shaped rolls at Hotel du Piment en Paris. New York City pigeons are not content like pigeons posing for photos on arms of men in the plaza of Caracas. New York City pigeons for fucking spending the main season shit on air conditioners and wipe their asses on windows while big cockroaches suck dark New York City pigeons are not alert like pigeons sitting quietly on bicycles in Peace Memorial Park of Hiroshima. New York City pigeons roll their pearly eyes and flake on the shoulders of pedestrians. New York City pigeons have no love for crumb throwing pigeon lovers and no year of the pigeon is celebrated, at least not for these New York City pigeons. I want to look, my friend. How might I hold your neck if you've bowed? How might the wind not know language if it pushes the grain, flipping every page, the skin of your nape to death? Where right my flesh? My friend, birds have flown from the fire with yet not none of a brittle ash beneath the fat of their wings. It seems a murder of crows sings only three times in the labyrinth, the corridor reeking of limestone and just one Norway maple as the rats reek of Scandinavian settlerism. This is of many flavors of spit, sometimes of hoop and owl. And even this early hour of afternoon sleep, a larvae crawls on the wall just above my eyes. Will a boy itself first, the blocks making a quadrant around the tree or the tree making itself encroaching? Look, my friends, where have you found the slick of memory? The birds are unscathed. It was only the red from the opening of the sky. My friend lay back. There is the fluff of milkweed. Meet me at the crunch of riverbed. We will bend back our tongues. The wind will jump around. My palms will meet the repose. Unbow your head. They cannot make viscous fermented pulp of you or I. The taste of my toast, like the stem of a stigma at the whim of a bee. I'm thinking of fried fish melting its way into styrofoam. I'd like to rank it a ghetto fossil, meaning it ascending over the slime of anthropology, contemporaneous history, like here I shatter enemy time while wait. There's a small bone of tilapia lodged in my throat. I like to say it a dam, at which I'm to invoke my grandmother, who is right beside me, even when I'm thinking of fried fish and the sluttiness of the macaroni and cheese. Not to mention the way the greens may always be a cartography for the smell of swamp, of Caribbean pit stop, of Zong, of Venus. Oh, I know the name, it sits on the breeze in my memory. Henry's. Thank you very much. Jalen, thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you. Uh, thank you for closing us with that reading. And thank you again to Lewis and to Andrew for today's incredible conversation. Um, I'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC and making daily conversations like this one possible and for their support of our growing archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel. 
For 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our monthly publication and public events like this one, our daily NSE. You can check the chat for a link to donate to support the rail. And if you're free on Monday at a special time of 6 p.m. Eastern, you can join us for a conversation with Macon Wang, Chang Tan, and Paul Gladstone on eco art in the Sinosphere. We'll conclude with a poetry reading by Brandon Griffin. And as is rail tradition, you all can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Osmos, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Lewis. Lewis. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Woo. See you all Thank soon. And go see the show. Absolutely. Woo. Thank you, Jalen. Beautiful reading. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the reading, Jalen.